At my first job, I had a colleague named Molly. She was a sweet, kind woman. No matter how tough the situation was, she would always manage to make people smile. Back then, I was looking for an apartment when I asked Molly. She said she had rented one of her rooms to a guy and she lives in the other one. But then she suggested me something. You know what? Come live with me for a couple of days, till you find a good house. I'll do all the arrangements. Honestly, being the small town girl in a big city did scare me about safety. So I happily agreed to stay at Molly's for a few days. And this is where the story begins. Molly's house was two-story, but the upstairs needed repair so no one used that area. The downstairs had two bedrooms. The big one was Molly's and the other one belonged to a man named JP. The first time I saw JP was the day I moved in. Molly and I were arranging my bed in the living room when I saw JP walk into the apartment. He looked weird. His hair was overgrown. And in the scorching summer, he wore this brown pullover with black jeans. At first he didn't see us, but once he turned his head hearing the sound from the living room, I got a look at his full face. He had a scar on his left eye that extended from his forehead to his left cheek. His pale green eyes gave me the creeps. Hello, Molly. Everything all right? Oh, yeah. JP, this is my friend Amara, and she's going to crash here for a couple of days. JP looked at me with a blank face. To get rid of the awkward silence, I spoke. I hope that's fine with you. I'm actually looking for a... He stormed out to his room, slamming the door loudly behind him. What the... That's strange. He's pretty friendly with me. Seriously, Molly? How can you even trust a guy like that, let alone make him your roommate? Oh, come on. I have training in karate. I can take care of myself better than you. Molly started joking to lighten up my mood and I shrugged it off eventually. But the more days passed, the more my suspicion grew about JP. As I slept in the living room, I had a full view of the apartment at night. Molly was always a deep sleeper, so she hardly came out of her room, but JP... I don't know what the hell was wrong with him. Often at night, I would wake up hearing footsteps in the kitchen, and my drowsy eyes would find JP standing near the kitchen sink washing something. I tried to lay still just to watch what he was up to, but all he did was wash something in the kitchen, put it in a plastic bag, and then go back to his room. I didn't tell Molly about this as I wanted to get more clarity. One night, I stayed awake waiting for JP to come out of his room. After hours of waiting, I heard a subtle click of a door. The hair all over my body stood straight up in anxiety. He's coming. He's coming now. Low thudding footsteps went to the kitchen and stopped. The faucet started running and I could smell bleach in the air. I slowly tilted my head to look at the kitchen. Why are you awake so late? I thought you always slept by 11. Is anything troubling you? I was numb with fear of having his wide, hawk-like eyes running on me. I could barely speak. My voice died down my throat. JP then hunched down to the floor, bringing his face right next to me. His filthy, warm breath touched my face, but I couldn't move away in disgust. I was that scared. My body was frozen. You should try to get some sleep, okay? He then leaned onto my face and kissed me on the forehead, which almost gave me a heart attack. And then, we went back to the kitchen. But it's all your assumption, Amara. You may be wrong, right? I'm definite that JP is mental. That guy can be a killer and no one will know it. I'm telling you, the way he... Good morning, girls. What are you guys talking about? I got quiet as soon as I saw JP. Molly looked at me and then asked him. Um, do you use the kitchen at night? JP's creepy smile changed into a scary frown. Why? Does that bother your friend? No, JP. That's not what I meant. What do you do in the kitchen at night anyway? Nothing. Just wash my clothes. But you have a bathroom for that. We eat in the kitchen. JP gave me a creepy smile and replied, Fine. I won't do it again. He grabbed the keys from the table and left the apartment without saying anything more. As soon as he left, I ran to Molly's room. Amara? Wait. What are you doing? I grabbed a bobby pin from Molly's jewelry box and walked straight to JP's room. Molly came rushing and grabbed my hand. Amara! He's my roommate, and as an owner, I can't let you ruin his privacy. I'm telling you, he's hiding something, Molly. He's not what he seems. But Molly didn't listen to me. 
Her trust in JP was so blind that she totally disregarded my words. We ended up having a fight and I left her apartment. I changed jobs as well to stay close to my family, and six months went by. One day, I got two officers visiting me at my house. They were asking questions about Molly. Her family filed a missing persons report three months back. The cops were searching for her and two days back they found her. She was lying dead under a bridge. Her body was discovered in such a decomposed condition that it was hard to tell the cause of her death. Tears rolled down my eyes hearing this, and then JP's creepy smiling face flashed in front of my eyes. But before I could tell the cops about him, the cops said they were suspecting Molly's roommate. JP eventually went to jail on the charge of second degree murder. But what's even more scarier is the fact that after Molly went missing, JP was the one who called her parents and insisted they file the missing persons report. The story you just saw is loosely based on the tragic death of Maribel Ramos, a 36-year-old Iraq war veteran. Maribel lived in an apartment in Orange, California, with her roommate Kwong Choi, known as KC Joy. On May 3, 2013, Casey called the cops saying Maribel hadn't come home for days. Her family reported her missing based on Casey's phone call. On May 17, 2013, the police searched a remote area in Majesca Canyon, California, and found Maribel's body in a shallow grave. The remains of her body were too decomposed to confirm the cause of death. Her boyfriend, Paul Lopez, told the authorities that Maribel had gotten into an argument with Casey about not paying rent, and she wanted him out of her place. When questioned by the police, Casey admitted to arguing with Maribel but denied all the accusations. The authorities had no evidence connecting Casey with her disappearance. However, the police noted that he had scratches on his arm. The cops also found a 911 call recording of Maribel talking about her roommate's scary behavior. The call was made 11 days prior to her death. During the trial, KC came up with a totally different story. He said when he came home, he already found Maribel's body. He claims he thought she killed herself, and out of fear of being suspected as a murderer, he drove away the suspicion by dumping her body under that bridge. KC Joy was eventually found guilty of second-degree murder. In September 2014, Casey was sentenced to 15 years to life. I used to work in a boarding house accommodating old and disabled people. The owner of the place was two elderly ladies named Ruth and Dorothea. They were friends and ran the place together. Ruth was a kind old lady who was the actual owner of the place. Dorothea was her business partner and roommate. On the ground floor of the house, five rooms were housing two people each. Dorothea and Ruth lived on the top floor. I never understood why, even after having an entire floor to themselves, they shared one room. Also, Ruth used to be sick often. After lunch, she would get a high fever, followed by vomiting. My job was to clean the house. One day, I was mopping the floor when I heard Ruth coughing and sitting on the stairs. I ran to her. Ma'am, are you okay? Do you want me to call a doctor? I think I'm getting sick. You need to give me the injection. Dorothea has gone to market. Okay, okay, uh, let me take you to your room and then show me what to do. I wasn't a trained nurse, but I grew up in hospitals. My father was a hospital staff member all his life. So I took Ruth to her bedroom and gave her the injection. I thought she might have some allergic reaction. The room was simple. Ruth's bed was near the sealed window, and Dorothea slept right next to the door. Slowly, Ruth started to feel better. She drank water and thanked me for helping her. Taking that opportunity, I asked, Why do you two manage in one room when three empty ones are sitting on this floor? I only insisted Dorothea stay with me. Actually, my health isn't good now. I often suffer allergies from time to time. Dorothea gives me all the medication and takes care of me. I frowned a little and checked the bed standing close to her. There were lots of medication and an empty vial. I was memorizing the names so I could find out what they were for when Dorothea walked in. How dare you come into our room? Don't you know no one is allowed upstairs? I'm sorry, Dorothea, but... Ruth stopped me and explained everything herself. Dorothea didn't say anything, 
but I could clearly sense her discomfort of having a third person in the room. My suspicion grew stronger when I saw Dorothea hiding a bag under the kitchen sink. She sneaked like a cat in the middle of the night. Her eyes and ears were on alert. She hid the plastic bag and quickly went back upstairs. I came to get water, but remained in the dark and watched her. After a few minutes, I went to the kitchen and checked the bag. I found stacks of cash wrapped in newspapers. Damn, where did she get this money? Is she stealing from Ruth? I was sure Dorothea was not a good woman. She had some dangerous intentions. I kept an eye on her. I saw her giving too many injections to Ruth. Whenever asked, she would say it was for pain relief. Poor Ruth thought she was getting sick due to old age. And then, one day, Ruth got very sick. Dorothea told everyone Ruth died out of old age. No one cared that much, and Dorothea became the new owner of the boarding house. Soon after Ruth's death, Dorothea boarded the second floor to new people. I wanted to leave my job, but I feared leaving these innocent people in her hands. I was positive Dorothea killed Ruth, but due to lack of evidence, she got away. After a few weeks, our boarders started to go missing. There was a man named Charlie. He had autism and was living with us. He was a shy but well-behaved man. He never caused trouble. One day, I saw him asking Dorothea about some money that his family sent him. Dorothea told him, "Mm, There were no checks with your name this month. But I saw Dorothea going to the bank with Charlie's check. Oh my god, she's cashing the checks without the boarder's will. That night, I woke up hearing a digging sound at the back of the house. I peeked outside my window and saw Dorothea again. This time, she was burying something in the backyard. Before I could see what it was, Dorothea stopped and turned her face right to me. I will never forget her eyes. She looked like a deranged psycho. Her face formed a slick smile. I could feel my legs shaking. I came back to my bed, locking my door. I was scared Dorothea would visit me in my sleep. The next morning, I went to call Charlie for breakfast, but he was gone. His suitcase, clothes, and books, all gone. Are you looking for something? But where's Charlie? He left to see his family. You let him go on his own? He's a grown man, and I'm not liable to answer you. What do you think? I don't know that you spy on me. I'm sure you steal from my room when I leave the house, you dirty witch. She jumped on me all of a sudden and bit me in the cheek. Some portion of my skin and flesh came out with a pull of her strong yellow teeth. I groaned in pain and started screaming. My scream set panic all over the house. Hearing the chaos, our next door neighbor called 911, and from there, the dark truths surfaced. Dorothea was taken to the station and interviewed about her misdemeanor. I told the cops everything I saw, and they decided to search the house. When they didn't find anything inside the house, they started digging in the backyard. Within five minutes, the boarding house was all over the news. There had been a discovery of seven bodies in the backyard. All were murdered and buried with their belongings. I went to see Dorothea before her trial started. She was sitting behind bars, hiding her face in her palm. For a moment, I thought she was being repentant, but as she lifted her face, hearing my footsteps, my blood froze. Hatred was splashing from her eyes. She looked angry as hell. But then, she suddenly smiled and said something that still gives me nightmares. I should have poisoned you two with Ruth that day. The story you just saw is loosely based on America's oldest female serial killer, Dorothea Puente. In April 1982, 
Fuente's friend and business partner, Ruth Monroe, rented a space in an apartment she owned. Shortly after moving in, Monroe died from an overdose of codeine and Tylenol. When Dorothea was questioned by the police, she said that Monroe had depression. Police officially ruled Monroe's death as a suicide due to lack of evidence. After that, Puente took charge of the place. She started housing the elderly, alcoholics, and disabled people. After drugging her victims, she buried them in the backyard of the two-story Victorian house and then cashed their social security checks. Her homicidal spree came to a halt in November 1988 when police came searching for a mentally disabled man named Alvara Montoya who'd been reported missing. Police eventually dug up seven bodies around the boarding house property. Two more bodies were found later, including the remains of Puente's former boyfriend, Everson Gilmouth, who was found in a box that had been dumped in the Sacramento River. Though there were no witnesses to the slayings, Puente was one of the most cold and calculating female serial killers the world has ever seen. When I was 22, I shifted to Michigan for college. I checked out a room for rent on Craigslist. I found a really nice two-bedroom apartment. It was cheap rent and close to campus, so it was the ideal spot. The girl who lived there was 29 and her name was Ava. She was tall and had jet black hair and wore pale makeup. She seemed nice, although a little shy, but she seemed to like me and agreed to let me move in. On the first night, we went for pizza, and that's when I could tell something was a bit off with her. Throughout dinner, she kept telling me how much I looked like Tom Cruise. I was flattered, obviously, but felt awkward, too. I mean, I looked nothing like Tom Cruise, so it just didn't make any sense to me. When we got back home, she asked if I had seen her room yet. I said no and she took me to see it. The room smelt of strong perfume which is not usual for any woman's bedroom. Her walls were covered in posters of Tom Cruise. She even had printed out photos of him all over her mirror. She owned all his movies. I didn't know what to make of it. It was creepy. The whole night she had been saying I looked like him and now it was obvious she had an obsession. A few weeks passed and I never really saw her that much. We didn't spend any time together really. She would come home from work and practically run to her room. She had this creepy high-pitched giggle, and I would hear her giggling through the walls at night. I wondered what the hell she could possibly be doing. Sometimes she wouldn't say anything and just stand in the hallway, watching me in the living room. I would turn and see her and be surprised and say, Oh, hi, Ava. (laughs) And then there would be this long, awkward pause. Then she would give out her creepy high-pitched giggle. It was uncomfortable being around her. She gave me the chills. One night I woke up around 2 a.m. because I heard what sounded like the front door being unlocked. I came out of my bedroom and all the lights were off. Ava was standing at the front door. She had her face against it and she was turning the lock back and forth over and over again. Every time she turned the bolt, she mumbled my name. Thomas Mills, Thomas Mills, Thomas Mills. Thomas Mills. Seeing her standing in the dark and mumbling my name really freaked me out. Ava, are you okay? She slowly turned her head to me without moving her body an inch. Her eyes were still. (laughs) And then she went back to her room. Now I was getting totally creeped out. I decided to look for a new place. The next morning I was having breakfast when the doorbell rang. I thought Ava was sleeping in her room, so I answered the door. Two cops were standing outside with stern faces. One of them asked me, Does Ava Winger live here? Yes, um, I'm her roommate. May I know what this is about? We're here to arrest her for the murder of Paul Smith, her previous roommate. What? Just then, a loud sound of glass shattering came from Ava's room. The cops pushed me aside and ran in the direction of the sound. I, too, followed them. They twisted the doorknob, but it was locked. The officer started knocking while calling out her name. Ava, you need to open the door. We know what you did. Open the door right now! But there was pin-drop silence on the other side of the door. The officer started kicking the door. Eventually, the lock gave up, and they broke it down. Peeking into the room, 
what I saw made me nauseous. Ava escaped by jumping from her window. The closet door was half open, and from that gap, a rotting hand was peeking out. Yes, a skinny, maggot-infested hand. Sir! Sir! There he is! We found the body! One officer pulled the closet door, and in there sat a man wearing a big paper mask printed with Tom Cruise's face. The officer removed the mask from his face and my stomach dropped. There were deep cut wounds all over his face, like someone decided to scorch his skin with a sharp object in a complete fit. His eyes were screaming with the horrible pain that he encountered right before his death. The paramedics came and took away the man's body. It was indeed Paul Smith, a 20-year-old guy who rented Ava's apartment last year. An investigation was open. The entire town had cops running over looking for a psycho woman who murdered her roommate. I had to leave the apartment and go to a motel after the cops sealed it up. I called my parents and told them everything. My mom was glad I wasn't hurt. Three days went by and I was searching for a new place. I was checking out a flyer at the local bus stand when I noticed a woman standing on the other side of the road. The woman was wearing a Tom Cruise mask. My gut feeling told me it was Ava. I called the cops right away, but before they could arrive, the woman was gone. I changed neighborhood because I wanted nothing to do with this crazy woman. Somehow I felt she was trying to warn me the second time I saw her. Her sudden appearance was nothing more than a death threat. A few more days went by and Mission Impossible 3 was released. A big hoarding was put up on the street featuring Tom Cruise in the lead. I saw it every day on my way to work. One morning, I saw cop cars and a chaotic crowd of people standing under that hoarding. Everyone was talking in fear and constantly pointing out the billboard. As I lifted my eyes, I saw it. It was Ava. She was hanging from an electric wire tied to the billboard. Her clothes were tattered and covered in dirt. It looked like she had been living in the woods all this time. But this time, she didn't giggle. She just hung there lifeless. Her dangling body moved slowly by the wind. Her obsession with Tom Cruise grew to such an extent that she climbed the billboard and got electrocuted by touching the wire, even though she was dead. Her face had this creepy wide smile with her eyes staring at the sky. 